Hi folks, I'm Bill Cook and I'm with uh, Lindsay Jensen and we're gonna talk a little bit about real estate investing and what we're seeing in the pandemic market. Uh, this is being shot on April the 30th, uh, 2020. So the market, you know, the, the, the pandemic is going down, the cases are going down. I know where I'm in Georgia and they've just released, restaurants are starting to open up. So we're starting to move forward again. And I've been filming a number of uh, videos through the downturn, a lot of times with old grizzly bastards. But you can tell by Lindsay is not an old grizzly bastard, but that doesn't mean she's not a been there and done that girl. She has. So Lindsay, if you'll talk a little bit about your background, where you are and what you do. Sure. Um, been in sales since I was 18 years old, but also real estate. My dad's an appraiser and has been a real estate appraiser since I was a baby. So I used to go help him at his office. So very familiar with houses. We, my mom and I used to go paint flips for them. Um, so kind of very involved in the world of real estate and then bought my first house when I was 21 and my second when I was 24 and um, still have both of those. And then um, I worked in and out of the, like the mortgage industry quite a bit. So I was very familiar with mortgages and lenders and um, stuff like that through my 20s. So yeah, kind of been involved in some capacity most of my life actually so that's more institutional you know mm -hmm. the, the normal rat that rat, what people think so how did you move to the to the other side to you know you joined the you joined the force you came with the good side the the the, the white knight so how did you make <laughs> that move and why uh i when i was 22 got mono and was watching an infomercial and it was rich dad poor dad so <laughs> read the book got the stuff and had wanted to do investing ever since. Um, so I already had a bug because when I bought my first house, it was to be a rental. So it, it was right, down, right up my alley um, when I saw that and then just learned a little bit more. Um, when I hit, once, once I got married and had a baby, just decided it was the right time to go for it. My husband and I both wanted to do this. Uh, jumped into some creative, you know, got involved in the groups in our in our area, and um, went to some creative deal making seminars. You happen to be the speaker at one of at my very first one. Was it? Was it really? Oh, that's what that was the one in Denver. Yeah. You told me about that. Yeah, I, I think I was up there with Dimitri. Yep. So that was my very first one. Blew my mind. Didn't even know you could buy houses that way. So that's the one that really got me into. Um, seller financing, sub twos, creative deal making. And that's where I really got started. Bought my first creative 0% seller financing about six months later. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad Dimitri and I had an effect or a number of other investors there too. But yeah. again, that's, that I'd heard it about Dimitri for a long time and that's where our paths finally crossed. So he and I had a really good time together. It's kind of like I ignored about everybody else and just started hanging with him and uh, playing games with him and having a lot of fun and at his expense and putting him down. And that was, that was an enjoyable experience for me because I think Dorsey was there too, wasn't she? Dorsey and Bill Tan. and Oh, Billy Tan. Yeah, I love Bill Tan. That's another one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so is this your, is this, or is this not your first big flex? Cause then you, you were going to be around to the, to the great recession of seven through 12, but were you doing, were you doing real estate investing back then? Or is this your first big, big, I won't, I call it a flux cause it's not so much that markets are, the, the values are tanking. It's just a flux. Something's up. Something's up. So this is my first one where we're, where I'm kind of looking at the market going, how do I handle this? And I'm listening a lot to people like you and Michael Jake and um, just kind of studying what's going on and being careful where we go with things. But um, I guess in, in 07, I had my primary and my rental up in Denver. So in some ways I very much was involved in that. I was also working in lending at the time. So um felt the effects of that big time because I, I literally knew people who would call me and say, oh, it was our company whose doors shut today. They didn't even fire them. You, you just couldn't walk in the building that day. Um, we had, I remember my brother was refinancing and they funded his first and not his second. Um, I think on mine, they said that they'd I was refinancing my house at the time and they're like, Oh, you have to bring $30,000 to closing if you'd like to close on your house. And I was in an arm. I was young and stupid and 
didn't know what could happen. And so I got caught in an arm for a little bit and had to figure out how to bring $30,000 not to, to closing so I didn't lose my house. So I, I did feel the effects of it, but I was not an investor like I am today. Okay, so let's go back six, seven weeks ago. How were you doing your business? Can I, can I explain how your business was running six weeks ago? Um, same as it has been for the last several years. We're doing but, but what do you do? What, your, your focus, mm -hmm. a, a day's activity, what type of deals are you looking for? We look for um, sub twos, lease purchases. As you would say, problems to solve. We can kind of do it all. We've done flips. Um, my main sources are direct mail and texting. Um, and so we would get phone calls from that saying, yes, we're looking to sell. And I would go out and meet the people and see if we could come to terms on what um, what worked for me and what worked for them and if I could help them. And then they'd say yes or no. And so that's kind of what it was looking like six weeks ago. And how busy was business six weeks ago? Not super busy. How come? Um, I had been working very hard on a property management project. So well, that's, that's right. That's right. So I was just kind of coming out of that and moving back into um, more marketing to get some more investment houses. Got it. And what are you seeing today? Has, has, the, has the market changed? Are you looking scared? Are, are prices going down, up, staying the same? What's happened over the last six weeks? So right when it very first hit and people said, you can't leave your house, we had three people go, yep, we're selling to you, right? I mean, we bought three houses in a week. Um, in fact, you, you, you sent me a, a postcard of an offer you had made yeah. and put on somebody's refrigerator two years ago. I think that's, that's one right. of the people who called you up and said, now I'm ready. Yep. So we had, um, we had some older phone calls come in and then we had some sign on the dotted line that week. Um, so right at that very beginning, I think there was some panic for those that were on the edge. And then um, it kind of just dropped off. There weren't phone calls. There weren't um, people weren't responding to the text messages. And for just a little while, when people were losing their jobs, we kind of pulled back from marketing, just feeling like, it potentially was not, how do I say this? It just didn't feel like good juju. Mm -hmm. um, and so I pulled back for a little bit and I'm now putting out different kinds of messages like, hey, we hope you're healthy. And, and I mean it too. I hope that they're healthy, but I want people to know that there's options there in case they need some help. Cool. And so right now, are you where everybody's just kind of like hunkered down? Because a lot of times when people yeah. get confused, if they're unsure about something, you can watch them. And it's almost like if, if something's going on in a, in a crowd and you, the first thing people do is they kind of duck down and they look around because they're trying to see which way they need to run to. And they don't know which way to run. So you know, like if shots are fired somewhere, you'll see them and they're looking to see which way everybody else is running. And if everybody all of a sudden starts running from left to right, you can, you're guaranteed that they're going to go run left to right with a crowd. And maybe they're running into danger and don't know it. They're just, they're lemmings following all the other lemmings. It's just, that's the way humans are built. And it takes, that's why we, we look at our first responders or our military people. When they run at gunfire, that's a trained thing. You know, they, they've learned to go do that. And they're running opposite of what every instinct they have in them is telling them to go do. So yeah. are you seeing hunkered down right now? Yes and no. So, um, I'm helping another friend of mine with getting some flips off the books. Um, they had a, an ops manager that was stealing from them and their um, houses were just a hot mess. So I kind of, they needed some help getting these houses finished and rehabbed and off the books. And we got them rehabbed pretty quickly and um, they're flying off the shelves. The second that they were allowed to go see houses in person, um, that day we got three houses under contract. For sale so so, um, so right now in, in Colorado you can go see houses for sale yes it, 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 go ahead big quantities that you can do one person showings okay so one person can walk in the house and the house needs to be vacant or can someone be living there um that's a good question honestly I don't know hmm. and while we're talking about government have you seen the government have they done anything special when it comes to landlords tenants that relationship so 
our governor is telling people that they don't necessarily have to pay rent. <laughs> really? So, yes. Uh, and how is it? And how is it that a, gov a government official can step in between a contract between a landlord and tenant, and then tell the tenant to say you don't have to pay rent? How? Where is that coming from? What, what authority do they have to step into uh, landlord-tenant law? Well, that's a good question. They're, um, you know, when you talk with a lot of the other investors, they're saying they don't have that right, and there could potentially be a lot of lawsuits down the line because we're not necessarily protected. Um, there's a lot of questions out there about. Lenders are saying they're helping people with their mortgages and saying, oh, it's, it, we're putting you in a forbearance. You can, you can get a forbearance for three months, possibly longer. Um, but for a little while, they were saying all three months were going to be due at the end of that three months. And I, I don't understand how that's going to help anybody. It's just going to prolong the issues. Now there's potentials of these lenders redoing that and saying that's not going to happen. I think things are happening so quickly. And they're throwing fixes into place and people are taking advantage of them just to get by. Cause I mean, this all happens so quick. They're losing their jobs. They can't pay their rent. They can't pay their mortgages and we're band-aiding everything without thinking about the long-term consequences here. Cause not everything is being looked at. They're like, Oh, it's furloughed. Most people aren't even asking if they have to pay that full amount at the end of three months and the lenders are not volunteering that information. So at the end of three or six months or whatever they're doing, who knows what kind of mess we're going to have. Again, there's a, there's a, a friend of mine named Dyke Spotterford wrote a special report on the difference between um, a forbearance agreement and a loan modification. And again, we're writing this, this is being recorded at the end of uh, April 2020. And I had Dykes put together a special report maybe six weeks ago. And it's at the top of his website. So if you go to assets101.com, the number 101. So assets101.com, at the top of his website, you'll see the free download. And it's free. And to have anyone with the name of Botiford do anything for free was amazing. <laughs> um, but if, if you do go download that, and again, it's a great report, documents you need, make sure you understand that because you're going to have to be the expert when you're talking to a homeowner and they say that they did a forbearance agreement, you better know what that is and how it works and how does that differ from a loan mod and maybe they should have done a loan mod because I will tell you that um, I have a lot of people we've sold houses to with owner financing, so we, we call these people payers. So I have a lot of tenants and I have a lot of payers and so far we got all of our checks in for April. So a couple of them came in a little bit late. I didn't charge a late fee, but they called and told me what was going on, but we got in all our checks. And I've already sent a letter going for May. I sent it out maybe about eight days ago saying, okay, May 1st is coming. Same thing. You know, if you got a problem, call and let me know. Let's work it through. You're not going to be evicted. You're not going to be foreclosed on. Um, you're taking great care of the home. There's a big difference between someone who can't pay and someone who won't pay. Now, if I have someone who won't pay, well, that's a, that's a, that's a horse of a different color, and they're not going to like what's going to happen because I promise you, six months from now, they will not be in that home anymore because I will not deal with someone who won't honor their commitments. But I understand someone who can't right now because this is an unusual situation. But anyway, so get Dykes' report, assets101.com, download it. Make sure you understand the difference when I was on a train of thought, which is um, if – I have someone who I've sold a house to with owner financing and they're going to have to miss a payment or two. More than likely, I won't use a forbearance agreement. I'm going to go right to a loan modification and move those payments to the back of the loan because if they don't have work right now to make them come up with two or three payments, two, two or three months from now, that doesn't make any sense. That's going to place a hardship on them because how many other bills are they not paying? What's happening with their credit card bills? And so I don't want to. I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. Right. So I'm going to go straight to loan mods, and not even think about forbearance. But there was one payer I have that, in his case, a forbearance might work well because what he's saying is, if I can skip this month's payment and then make three, you know, uh, divide that payment into three, and add it into my payments, he said I'll have my job back by then, and I can do that. So for him, a forbearance agreement works. But for most of my people, they come to me, we're just going to do a straight loan mod. So know what that is and understand, become the expert in that field because for the next six months to a year, you're going to hear forbearance and loan mods a lot. Yes. So right now, are you starting to ramp up your business? Are you, are you still kind of hunkered down too, Lindsay, or what are you doing? 
No, I'm ramping it up. And in ramping it up again, mailers or what do you? How do you? How do you ramp up? Um, started with text messaging. I'm gonna start doing some more videos, um, and then mailers as well. Yep. Okay. When you do videos, because again, you have a unique system you use. Explain what that is and how it works. So with mine, um, I started out doing case studies. So case studies with how I'm helping people. So um, I have them after we've closed on their house, I have them, I have a couple questions for them and it can be different because everybody's situation is different. So I just, a lot of times I'm very interested in why they chose me. I actually sometimes don't know why. Um, and you know, there's times where I think you and I had talked about this deal where somebody had come to them and said, Hey, we can give you what you want. And I couldn't give them the amount they wanted, but the other person was a wholesaler and had lied to them about the process of wholesaling, but said they were going to close on their loan. The next thing I know, I get a, an email showing this house that I thought I was going to get a contract on for sale. And I asked them if they were under contract because that's what it said in the email. And they said, no. So that person completely lost their trust. So there's all kinds of interesting things I find out in my videos and I just put it out there so that not only can my friends and family understand what I do because um, there's no, it's literally solving problems, which is what you say all the time. There's, um, it doesn't matter how much you owe or what your payment is or anything. We just have to sit down and look at the situation. So I do and, that, and that's, and that's your nature anyway. That, that's how you operate. You yeah. operate from that train of thought. That's just, that, that, that's your DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if someone wanted to be able to see your videos, is there a place that they can go to see them? Do you want to share that? Um, sure. It's new, it's new Generation Homes on YouTube. I'm going to go look at it too. Cool. So you have videos there. And if someone wants to contact you, again, this is a little bit early in the conversation for this, but if someone wants to contact you, how do they contact you? Because you're gonna have you're gonna you're gonna have investors out there watching this going, well, I like her, you know. And there's gonna be women, especially women, because women need to talk to other women investors because they're gonna feel more comfortable. I know that Kim uh, loves getting together with her girlfriend investors, and when the guys are around, they just kind of look at us like we're big dork dorkheads. <laughs> but when the girls are together, I mean, they they have their own little clique and they go to their own meetings and do their own thing, and she has a ball with it. I get it. I have a girl group out here that we we love sitting and talking shop and. Sometimes we're surrounded by so many males, not that we don't love you all, but um, it's kind of nice to have your goals that you can sit down and talk with. But um, yeah, so if you go to my website, it's www.newgenerationhomebuyers.com. All my contact information is there. Cool. Okay, so let's go back to your business. And because you said you do sub two deals and a lot of people, First, explain what a subject to deal is, and then explain why, when you're talking to a seller, why would they ever let you agree to make their mortgage payments for them? So a subject to deal is where I actually purchase the house from them. Um, it could be with no cash exchanging hands. It could be with a certain amount exchanging hands, meaning me paying them zero to five or 10 or 15,000 depending on the, the structure, the deal, what's needed. Um, we actually go to a title company and close on the house. So the deed transfers from their name into mine, but the loan stays in their name. And then I take, well, I don't take over their payments, but I, I make their payments for them. I log into their, their loan site and make their payments. So, it's, um, so, so you're not assuming their note. No. You're not assuming their loan at all. It right. stays in their name. So why would somebody agree to this? Um, it's funny because when I first learned about this, my dad said the same thing. Why would anyone ever do that? <laughs> There's a number of reasons. Um, <laughs> we've had people who a lot of times they just refinance their house and then have a life change and they now owe way too much to be able to sell their house. So they want to move out of state to go get another job, their dream job that they didn't think they were going to get that they did get. And um, they don't want to have to deal with this house in Colorado anymore. That, that was one of my deals we closed last year. They wanted to move down to Texas. They would have had to have brought, um, they had 10,000 in rehab that needed to be done to the house. And then they had probably about 25,000 they would have had to have 
brought to closing to sell it. So they would have had to come out of pocket about $35,000. Yep. And then th 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 that makes sense. Yeah. But when you go, when you went into the house, did you go in thinking this is going to be a subject to deal? Well, I didn't know. I just went in and said, well, what's the deal? How much do you owe? Um, what are you looking to get done? And by the end of it, it was, this is how this has to work for me to be able to help you. So they gave you the, in, in, in answering your questions, they gave you the structure. Yes. And that's one of the questions I get all the time is how do I know which structure, structure to use? And the answer is you listen, the seller will tell you what to use. They'll tell you what they need. And then you just use those tools to make that fit that particular deal. But rarely do I sit back and say, Oh, you know, walk in the front door. This is what we're gonna do here. And in fact, I don't think I've ever done that. Other than when I was a new investor and went, all I can look forward to do is pay you 70 cents on the dollar. And that was my entire offer. I mean, you had to pick up equity from the get go. And if they didn't agree to that, there was no deal there. And a lot of people who started investing after 2012, that's the boat they're in. They only know how to do what you see on A&E, which is flip or wholesale. And you've got to buy the house for 70 cents on the dollar minus rehab expenses. And then everybody's making exactly the same offer to the same people over and over and over again. And they can't understand why the competition is so strong or why they don't get a deal. Well, you know, if all the, uh, if all the boats are in the, all the ships are in the red ocean, you know, they're sailing around in a tight area and they're bumping into each other. How about sail into the blue ocean, get out of the red ocean, go to the blue ocean where you can sail around by yourself. And that means a whole lot less competition and you're going to be able to structure deals that nobody else knows how to structure because you're actually structuring solutions to the problems that people have. Exactly. It's based on what they need versus I only want to do this kind of deal. Um, sometimes there's a, a potential for two different solutions and I literally let them pick. I say I can do it this way or I can do it this way. Which one works better for you? Why do you let them pick? Um, because I've structured it in a way that I can make it work maybe two ways. Maybe I can um, buy it and flip it, or maybe I can make payments to them and keep it as a rental. Good. And let's talk about rentals for a second, because a lot of people, they call themselves investors when in fact they're wholesalers and flippers. So that's not an investor. That is someone who's a good business person. You're basically a grocer who buys a can of beans for a dollar. You're going to sell the big can of beans for $3. If you're lucky, you get to net out 25 cents after all said and done expenses are covered. And there you got your quarter. But if you want another quarter, you got to go buy another can of beans for a dollar, sell it for three, and you just, you're going to be in business the rest of your life. And but you got to keep finding that can of beans. So Lindsay, you also have the mind of an investor where you also are a landlord where you have investment properties. What made you do that? Um, hold on. Let me see if I can find it. This book. So I read this right before um, I really? right first started getting into investing and reading through all this and the structures and what Wait, people. Can, can, you, can you hold that up? I want to see this. Hold that up again. That is where the, you know, I'm in there. Are you? Yeah. And so Dyke Spotifer's in there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you were in here. Yeah. Um, but so, it, it, I, so I haven't seen that because I came out in like 75 or uh, 2005, 2006. And I haven't even seen that book in a long time. I had to read it because I thought it was, a, it looks like a brand new book. And I went, oh, did he come out with another book? And uh, yeah. Anyway. That's pretty, I'll have to go find you in there. That's uh, no, no. In fact, the, the quote that I have in there and see if this sounds familiar. Our job as real estate investors is not to buy, sell, or rent houses. Our job is to solve people's real estate problems. And so that's the quote they have in, in their me giving. And so that's how far back that goes. And again, you heard me say over and over, it really goes back to Zig Ziglar saying, you know, I'll, I'll, you'll get exactly what you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. And I heard that in 1979. And it really goes back to biblical stuff. And so it's been around for a long time but it's about them, not you. And if you're out there to go find problems to solve and people to help, you'll do very well in life. But if you're gonna go out there and all you have is a big damn hammer, then everything's gonna be a nail. And a lot of what you do, a lot of the offers you make, because you don't know another solution and you don't know the best solution for them, you're just gonna walk right by it. You have no idea how much money you're losing on a weekly basis, because you, you don't have the tools to structure. But let's go back to landlording. I interrupted you, Lindsay. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Um, it's why you and I see so 
eye to eye and why once I saw how you connected with people, it just resonated with me and um, getting it offers accepted just took off for me because it was so comfortable structuring that way versus so many people that teach you to go in there. And like you said, it's just the big hammer every single time. And it was never a comfortable thing for me to do to people. It was never comfortable for me to point out a hole in a wall and say, mm, you know what I mean? Like that just was, and, and I've had in, um, plat, like, uh, teachers of classes tell us to do that in order to get the deal. And it just, was so let's go back to, let's go back to that for a second. So why don't you go to them and say, Hey, look, there's a big hole in the wall or that the floor is leaning over there or that there's a stain in the carpet. Why don't you do that? You're putting down their house. Um, it's, ex I mean, I remember door knocking with you and you saying, don't do that. And it made, made so much sense to me because it was nothing I was ever comfortable with doing. So they would tell you to do that so that you could really drive home how crappy their house is. But you don't leave people feeling good when you leave there. You box them into a situation that you might have to push them in. Um, my, when I leave somewhere, people feel or at least I think most people feel really good. I end up being friends with them for a very long time. So, um, and it honestly doesn't matter to me if they do a deal with me, if I can help them find a solution that works. And you become known, you become known as that person. Cause I, again, you know, I've worked that five mile circle for so, for so long and I got known as, you know, if you got a problem, and you know, you talk to the realtor and the the closing attorney and the mortgage broker, and they can't help you. Call Bill; he'll 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 figure it out. And I just had that reputation, and I'd go meet with people all the time. And ninety five percent of the time, I was not the solution. However, I knew the solution, and the solution wasn't me. The solution was, and I said, "This is what you should go do." Now, I still made them a written offer. I never failed to make the written offer and said, "You know, I I'm a solution, but not your best solution." But if you decide to go with me, here's my offer. And that's one of the things I liked about that postcard you sent me where that lady had that postcard on her refrigerator for a, two years yeah. and then called you out of the blue, you know, a month ago, a month and a half ago to say, we're ready to go. But if you hadn't, if that offer hadn't been made, if that wasn't on the refrigerator, no deal. Well, and it reminded me because I had gotten out of the habit of using those postcards to write my offer on. And, um, Lindsay, I know bad. So it reminded me, and now there's a whole stack of them in my car. So now I leave those with Good. everybody now. And, and yeah, and, and remember the T-bar. Always that's the that's the two biggest things was that those cards and me writing those little teeter totter offers everywhere, and then the T-bars. The T-bars were so important. Um, I want to go back to you working as a landlord. And you know, you you said that you read uh, uh, Keller's book to uh, kind of that's what kind of got you started on that path. Yeah. And talk a little bit about what you do with master leasing, what it is, and how that works, and why you why why what intrigued you about that, what what captured you, what about that deal structuring technique that really hit hit home for you? Um, when I read the book, the people just said, "Look, I it just it's exactly what you said that flipping is a forever job." where when you um, have rentals, those people stay in your house, they pay down your mortgage, and eventually you have this producing asset that produces for you over and over and over. So eventually you don't have to work if you don't want to. Um, when you're flipping that money, if you can't work, it stops. Or, you know, if you don't have the right team in place even. Like I do most of my landlording by myself because my tenants are my partner. I don't have to have this huge team that I pay in place. And um, it just kind of goes with, along with the person that I'm helping right now, he had his ops manager steal from him and hire her friends to do stuff that they weren't actually doing. And it, it's a, it's a hard job <laughs> flipping. So, um, and then meeting with meeting and learning David Tilney's system. It how, how, how good of a teacher is David Tilney? Amazing. I just sent you some pictures this morning showing. I saw that. Yeah, in fact, yeah, I saw him responding to them. But I saw those pictures. That's, that's what got me to think about you as far as I wanted to call and interview you. Because explain what the pictures were because they're of gardens. Explain what's going on. So what's going on is I have a tenant that's in a house that has a, a ginormous backyard. But it, it needed some love. And I 
when I was uh, looking for renters, I posted on there, I want some renters who are going to love this yard like it's their own and put some love into it. And um, when I'm interviewing them, not only do I, you know, look at the credit and all the normal stuff, but I really, I talk to the people too and find out what, what their interests are and do they, you can usually hear it. And the way they talked about that backyard and what they want to do back there, it just hit me and I knew they were the right people for it. And so what they've done to it is they've, um, well, they've done a ton of work, but the most recent ones, like the pictures I sent you this morning, they've put in some retaining walls in the back. They've planted a flower garden, an herb garden, and it just looks gorgeous. So it's really fun when they make their, their home, you know, your house, their home. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to master leases. We talked about David Tilding, what a great teacher he is. and We love him to death. So what do you want me to say about master leasing? What, what about master leasing intrigued you? Because you know, you're going to hear a, a lot of different types of structures that can be used, but you took that and ran with it early on. You have a cat. I do. I have two of them. Oh, I just saw one walk by. <laughs> so with the master leasing, I still remember seeing David Tony at Michael Diggs meeting the first time and hearing this concept and how you can, you know, use other people's assets to supplement your own income by taking care of it, taking care of their assets for them. Um, and then not only that, but then you're the person that they trust and know when they're ready to sell. Um, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks and I thought, oh my gosh, I wanna know what this is. <laughs> I need to know how to do this, how he does this. And the really neat thing about it is once I learned to manage, um, owning a bunch of rentals and it took so much fear out of the investing game for me um, because of that. Like when this COVID-19 thing hit, I didn't have tenants calling me and saying, I can't pay or I don't want to pay or I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm going to go, I'm going to go on strike. I just refuse yeah. to pay you, Lindsay. No, no, no. They, they called me and said, are you doing okay? Are, are people able to pay you? Blah, 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 blah. I mean, people called to check on me. No, not the other way around. So it was really awesome. And um, kind of like you, I only had, I had one tenant who I had to pay in two, two separate checks instead of all at the same beginning of the month. And then one tenant who was 150 bucks short. And that was it. So it was, it was not too darn bad. Yeah, and it makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, and, and if you all want to learn about master leasing, we, you heard us talk about David Tilney. So that would be David Tilney, T I L N E Y dot com. But he is a, a masterful guy. And I, I talked to uh, the, the guy who, uh, well, I won't say who he is. But anyway, I, got, I talked to a guy this morning and he's about to buy, he, he's, he called me about buying two apartment buildings that are in a, you know, part of the, most of the land is in a flood zone. And by the way, he's, he's, he's never had a tenant in his life and he's got on some type of coaching program that I've never heard of before. And yeah, he, he's just chasing himself in the circle. And I said, before you get started on the whole apartment building, let's structure this thing out. Have you ever managed a tenant before? No. And he's about to buy an apartment building. I mean, you talk about having problems coming at you in spades and you really people have to realize that landlording is not a born knowing how to do a thing it's a learn thing and you have to go to the very best teachers and and david tilney is the very best teacher so again when it comes to a landlording great teacher when it comes to teaching master leases but he won't let you take his master lease course until you take his landlording course first because before you can rent someone's property with the ability to rent that to someone else you got to know how to take care of that property in the first place and that's why the landlording is so important so, Lindsay, last question for you. Um, along the way, as a real estate investor, you've hit the wall where you think, to hell with it. Screw it all. I don't want to do this anymore. Done. How did you not quit? How did you get around or over or under that wall and keep going? Because we all hit it from time to time. We don't hit it once. We hit that wall a couple times in our career where we're just like, to hell with it. Why didn't you quit? And what did you do not to quit and keep going? It was funny. I knew I was, I think I knew I was, I mean, I wasn't going to quit. I was just hitting a point where it was a little more freaky, like, because you start getting so many houses that I know first world problems, but you start getting so many that you're like, <laughs> what if, or, oh my gosh, this is going to eat me alive. Or I have to do something more so that I have more income to be able to either buy more or make sure that these 
I have a good amount of reserves. And um, it was actually funny because you had called me one day. You didn't even know I was going through it at the time. And you started talking about it. I was like, oh, so this is a normal thing. And it kind of just went away. So part of it is just the fact that you started talking about it and let me know that it was normal. And you didn't even know at that exact moment I was going through that. No, so I, that, I, still, I, I still don't know that. I had no idea. Yeah, it was, it was literally just a month or so ago. Um, it was a freaky situation and just kind of a... This was that thing. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And it was also because I was on a path with a property management company that ended up not being a good path. Yeah. And so you start thinking a lot about a lot of things and you're just like, which am I doing the right thing? Am I going the right way? And um, it was literally just that short conversation that we had. So it was kind of knowing that other people go through it that snapped me right out of it. But you also knew, you know, I didn't tell you you were on the wrong path. You knew you were on the wrong path. You had already made the steps to say, hey, I don't belong here. And I, I, I talk over and over about cadence. You got to know your cadence. And, you know, Kim and I did 12 or 15 deals a year. And that was it. And it was over the course of, you know, 20 years. But we just stayed real constant, real consistent with what we did. And I would have friends of mine that could go out and do 15 deals in a month. And I swear to you, I felt like that big. I felt like the biggest failure and the biggest loser because they were going out and turning and burning and flipping and wholesaling and all these deals. And I just, I was like, how do they do it? You know, how, and they would have like three different crews doing rehabs for them. And I can barely keep one crew together. And a lot of times Kim and I were doing the work ourselves. And I swear to you, I, I felt like the fail, a failure for more than a decade. But then I started realizing we were doing okay. And for my cadence, what worked for me, it was okay. It just took a while for me to understand that. And it's the same thing with you. Find out what your cadence is. And your cadence may be 30 properties. And it may be two properties a year. But whatever that is, make that fit you. Don't sit back and look at someone else and say, why can't I be them? Because when God put you on earth, he gave you two or three things, traits, abilities. And in the combination that you have them, nobody else has those, those traits, those combinations that you can make. You can be so good at those things. And that's where you should focus, your focus should be. So God did not plan for me to be a roofer. And so I'm not a roofer. I'm not upset that I don't roof houses. But he made me really good at a kitchen table. So that's really important. So anyway, Lindsay, so going back to you. So you came through that pretty quick. Had you had any other, any other episodes where you just thought, ah, maybe not for me. Maybe I need to go back to corporate or something like that. <laughs> never been there. Um, great look great look <laughs> i'm not built for corporate life um no i've always kind of been entrepreneurial and owned my own businesses and stuff like that even when i was doing other things so um no i've i don't think anything else and i don't even think when i was going through that it was super serious as far as thinking i was going to throw in the towel it was just more of a where am I going? What am I doing? Am I going on the right path? Am I not going on the right path? And um, it was, I took kind of a left turn that didn't work out. And I went kind of like you said, learn your cadence. And I went right back to what I knew and what I enjoyed and what I, um, what was working. You know, what was, what was funny was, was going on the background that you didn't know about is David and I were both talking to each other going, she's making a mistake. This is a bad <laughs> idea. She shouldn't be doing this. And so we both kind of had a feel for what your cadence was and how you were supposed to be working. And just both, we were both concerned. And so when you, you, you changed directions again, and again, got back on a, 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 a path that we thought fit you real well. It was like, all right, go Lindsay. Yeah. High five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, sweetheart. Anything else you want to add? Um. Not that I can think of. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the over the coming months. I do think there's going to be some people out there that we need to help. And uh, hopefully there's not people out there. I hope there's people out there that are going to truly help and not take advantage. What do you think? What, what do you see happening over the next six months? Year? Um, as far as Colorado Springs goes, the news reports and everything still say the the market is super strong. So people's confidence here, as far as real estate goes, is still very high. Um, 
we weren't shut down for too long and I don't think too much has happened, but I, I do think for those that did have to take advantage of it over the next six months to a year, we're going to start seeing some things pop up where they can't afford a lifestyle anymore or put them in that situation where they can't afford that thousand dollar hooks. And um, we'll have to probably be there to fix some problems. You know, one of the things I, I find amazing is I remember reading a report about six months ago. And I know I think David put it on his thread too. He put that may be where I first saw it. But it said basically that 60% of Americans, which I thought was a huge percentage, if they faced a $1,000 repair, house repair, car repair, whatever, they did not have the money in the bank to pay for it. And I found that amazing. And that was just six months ago. And now we're going through this where so many people are home and they're not working. And I understand the stimulus checks are going to come out and you got unemployment. And, and I get that. But my guess is credit cards are being lived on. And money is being borrowed from things like family, which is to make Thanksgiving Christmas, because that money may or not may not be paid back by then. It's going to make Thanksgiving and Christmas a little bit uncomfortable for people. Right. And I'm I'm real curious to see where this wash actually goes. And it's almost like when uh, my family's from South Louisiana, and so you know you you had the the hurricane come the hurricanes come through. I remember we were at my aunt Hazel's one day. I went back to to help her clean up. And, you know, the hurricane coming through is one thing. It's there and it's gone. And you look around and go, wow. And, but when all of a sudden you start working, you realize the amount of work it's going to really take to get things back to normal. You can't see that after the hurricane leaves. You see down trees and flooded this and you're like, wow, there's a lot of water there. And I remember my Aunt Hazel would just look at me and go, Billy, this is a bad time here. We got got going over here. I don't know about all this stuff. We got to get, we got to get old cleaning on this stuff, get those trees down, which you think there. And, you know, we're working hard and it, it took a lot longer than we thought. And about halfway through that work, you're like, will this ever end? And uh, is, there, is there an end in sight? And you just got to keep going and understand there is an end. And uh, there is a light of the tunnel. And we just keep praying that it's not a train coming at us. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, anyway, Lindsay, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. I, I greatly appreciate you. And just, just know that, you know, Kim and I are so proud of what you do and how you work and what your husband and you and your husband are accomplishing. And uh, just you're an amazing woman. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's nice having, like, the best support in the world out there. So. <laughs> okay, sweetheart. I'm going to end the recording now and then say goodbye to you. But let's end the recording like that. Wait, I think I did the wrong thing. I got into that. I need to end a recording.